tonight on Reporting Scotland. The former Scottish Labour leader Kezia Dugdale didn't have permission from the party to go on the reality TV show I'm a Celebrity. A living wage for students. A report recommends they get a minimum of £8,000 a year. At the moment, they can get a student loan of just under £5,000. At the moment, I need to work in the Christmas holidays and summer holidays non-stop in order to be able to fund myself during, during uni. Also on the programme. There are calls for more 20 mile per hour zones as new figures reveal almost 10,000 people were injured on Scotland roads in a year. The Australian rugby squad have arrived ahead of their match against Scotland in their final autumn test this weekend. And fancy hunkering down in a bunker? A once secret World War II underground facility in the Highlands is up for sale. Hello there, good evening. The former Scottish Labour leader Kezia Dugdale is due to arrive in Australia in the next few hours to take part in the reality TV show I'm a Celebrity. But back home, her successor as party leader, Richard Leonard, says she didn't have permission to go. The party is to consider what action, if any, to take against her. Here's our political correspondent, Glenn Campbell. When the new series of I'm a Celebrity went on air last night, there was no sign of Kezia Dugdale in the jungle. But she's on her way to Australia and expected to appear in the reality show in the next few days, much to the irritation of some party colleagues. We elect them to do a job in Parliament, not to faff about on celebrity TV programmes. I don't think people would expect um, them to uh, jet off around the world and sit around a campfire eating you know, kangaroo's appendage. It is hypocritical. There's no two ways about that. Kezia Dugdale's successor as party leader, just two days into the job, insists she did not have permission to do the show. She didn't tell me for a minute uh, that this is what she was intending to do. And had she? I would have uh, given her the advice that at that point I would have thought that was a bad idea. Why? Well, because I don't think it's something which uh, most people would view as being appropriate for a, an elected active politician to take part in. But Miss Dugdale is not without fans in the Labour Party. If politicians can go on it and manage to get some sort of message across, then it may well be a good thing. For Kezia, I think it's probably a very good thing. I think she's had to let off a bit of steam following her time as leader of the Scottish Labour Party. So I wish her every success. She's not the first politician to cross over into entertainment telly. When Lib Dem MP Vince Cable was in the Cabinet, he took part in the Christmas version of Strictly Come Dancing. Oh. Since he mentioned it! <laughs> Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson was MP for Henley when he was host of Have I Got News For You. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Tommy! And former socialist MSP Tommy Sheridan appeared on Celebrity Big Brother after he lost his Scottish Parliament seat. Of course, Kezia Dugdale is still a serving MSP. So what do her Lothian constituents think? Why should she not do it just because she's a politician? And they're worried she says something she shouldn't say. Good for her, that's what I say. I wouldn't really imagine how that would increase her like political standing at all, so that seems like a strange idea to me. But... She's going over to Australia for a free holiday and she's going to get paid for it anyway, so it's not too bad. Experiencing the outdoors in Glasgow, this SNP minister said the jungle would not be for him. I've got plenty of sense of humour, I just don't fancy um, mucking about with creepy crawlies in the jungle for a prolonged period. I've also got a job to do. Visiting an Edinburgh poppy factory, the Scottish Conservative leader suggested the jungle was easier to survive than life in the Labour Party. It's entirely up to, to Kez and I think given the the massive chunks that some of the colleagues on her own side have taken out of her, a wee nibble from a creepy crawly is going to be water off a duck's back while she's there. Swapping the political jungle for life in the Australian jungle will allow Kez Dugdale to talk to a mass audience and earn her tens of thousands of pounds, some of which she'll donate to charity. But the decision to go in the jungle is not without hazard. Never mind the bush tucker, there's all the backbiting from her political colleagues who've yet to meet to decide whether or not she should face formal disciplinary action. Glenn Campbell, Reporting Scotland. 
Well, I'm joined now by our political editor, Brian Taylor. Brian, Richard Leonard, only just appointed leader there at the weekend of Scottish Labour, presumably taking questions about his predecessor, he isn't can, how he wanted to start no, this I mean, off. He can scarcely believe it. The, the reaction in Labour veers between bewilderment and anger. You know, you hear folks saying, for goodness sake, Kezia Dugdale caused this contest by standing down and then causes an overshadow, a difficulty, a distraction for her successor just at the very moment uh, he is successful. Rivals political rivals are tending to say, go on, go for it, Kez. Of course they are. They can scarcely believe their political luck. So when the dust settles on this, then what's in the entry for him? He's got lots. He's got three big ones. He's got to sort out the Alex Rowley business. That's his deputy, currently suspended from the Parliamentary Party over accusations which he vigorously and strenuously denies. He's got to ready uh, Labour for the tax uh, policies that they have to set out. Basically, he's favouring an increase in taxation, including an increase in the standard rate. The UK budget's on Wednesday. The Scottish budget budget is shortly thereafter, three weeks after that. Before that, he's got to appoint a front bench team at Holyrood. He's got to appoint a front bench team from within a parliamentary group, two, uh, two, two times as many of whom supported his rival as supported him. Talking of rivals, to cap it all, O'Brien, he's come out as an England fan. <laughs> he has indeed. <laughs> it's just got it all now. I, I think, you know, at least the guy's being honest. You know, he's born and raised in Yorkshire. What do you expect? Of course he's an English fan. He's supporting England, he says, against Scotland in football and rugby games. You know what? At the very least, he's being straight. He's not trying to pretend that he's a paid-up member of the Tartan army. That, that sort of chicanery, uh, perhaps in the reverse, has landed other politicians in trouble in the past. Indeed. Brian, many thanks. Now, all college and university students should have a guaranteed income of £8,100 a year. That's the key recommendation of a commission set up by the Scottish Government on student funding. The figure, which represents a big rise for many students, would be made up of loans and bursaries. The government said it wanted every student, especially those from Scotland's most deprived communities, to have the right financial support. Our education correspondent Jamie McIver reports. Niall is facing the stress of his final year studying economics. We're getting close to, the, close to the end of the first semester anyways. He isn't from a rich family, but he isn't from a poor one either. His annual family income is more than £34,000, so that means the most Niall can get is a student loan of up to £4,750. At the moment I need to work in the Christmas holidays and summer holidays non-stop in order to be able to fund myself during uni. I mean, this would alleviate the pressure quite a lot. All Scottish students get free tuition, but help towards living costs is more complicated. It's a sliding scale, and those from the poorest families get the most help, around £7,600 a year from bursaries and loans. Those who are better off get less. This is a detailed and complicated report, but at its heart is one simple message. It calls for all college and university students in Scotland to have an income of £8,100 a year. Just how much of that money would come from a loan would depend on the family's earnings. What it means is every student has an entitlement to a minimum income of £8,100 to make sure that they can really properly um, embark on their studies and complete them in the knowledge that they've got fair finances to do so. Other recommendations include raising the salary someone needs to earn before they start repaying loans and giving college students the same financial support as those who are at university. From the government, a promise to consider the report carefully. We'll look very seriously at the report's recommendations. We'll look to see what can be done to encourage more young people into colleges and universities. And we'll need to do that with an eye on how it interacts with the benefits system. These proposals could be a real help to many students and their families. They could also play a part in raising the number of university students from disadvantaged areas. But for those who'd prefer old-fashioned grants to loans, the report doesn't quite go far enough. Well, Jamie joins me now from outside the Scottish Parliament. Jamie, if these recommendations are accepted by the Scottish Government, will we see more students from deprived backgrounds going to university? Well, that's certainly a top priority for the government, Katrina. Now, this living wage we're talking about, it isn't some cash bonanza for the poorest students. It's only about £500 a year more than they're currently able to get in grants and loans. But that's not to take anything away from the importance of a figure. It's a great way of highlighting the help and support that's available. And combined with possible changes to the student loan repayment system, it can all help to make universities seem like a more affordable option. The possible changes to college students 
funding are important too because of the role colleges play in helping youngsters from disadvantaged areas move on to university. But ultimately nobody is pretending that widening access to university is just about money and money alone. There's the question of raising attainment in schools. There's the issue that the universities were highlighting last week when they looked at how to create more of a level playing field in the admission system. It's really about how all the different factors can come together to try to solve what everybody would admit is a very complex problem. Jamie, many thanks. A former Rangers and Liverpool football scout who was awaiting trial on child sex abuse charges has died. 84-year-old Harry Dunn was arrested in March this year and released on bail. He was named in newspaper reports in March amidst a UK-wide scandal over the abuse of children by football coaches. One of his alleged victims says he's devastated that Dunn will escape trial. And you can see an exclusive interview with his alleged victim, Levi Stephen, on this week's Timeline. That's on Thursday at 7.30 on BBC Two Scotland. Thousands of people have attended the funeral of a Scottish man killed while working as a police officer in Canada. John Davidson, originally from Hoyk in the Borders, was shot dead while arresting a suspect in British Columbia. The 53-year-old was described as an amazing dad and friend. Hundreds of police officers and members of the public lined the streets of Abbotsford to pay their tributes. A new, simpler bowel cancer screening programme is to be rolled out across Scotland. The Health Secretary Shona Robison unveiled the new test at a laboratory in Dundee. It will require just one stool sample to be returned instead of six. Testing kits are sent out to people aged between 50 and 74 every two years. It's hoped it will encourage more of them to take part in the programme. I'm hoping that people find it easier to do and therefore will have better return rates. The pilots have suggested a 5% increase in the return rate for the, the new test. So it's simpler, easier and of course the message is please return it because it can be a lifesaver for so many people. A construction worker on the Queen's Ferry crossing has described the moment a colleague was fatally injured after being hit by the arm of a mobile crane. John Cousin, a fitter from Northumberland, was killed during an attempt to repair the faulty piece of machinery. Today, a fatal accident inquiry into his death got underway in Stirling. Stephen Godden reports. It was workers' memorial day. Those building the Queen's Ferry crossing had briefly stopped to observe a minute's silence. Not long afterwards, one of their own had been fatally injured. 62-year-old John Cousin was a fitter from Northumberland. At that point in the project, he was working on the North Tower. Today, his family were in court in Stirling as a fatal accident inquiry got underway, a mandatory process when someone is killed at work. First to give evidence was Lucas Hollis. He was asked about an exclusion zone he'd set up around a mobile crane that had started leaking oil onto the deck the day before the accident. During an attempted repair the following morning, he was one of three people, including John Cousin, close to the crane when it leaked again. Mr Hollis was cleaning up the oil spill when he heard a noise like two pieces of steel scraping together. When he turned around, he saw John Cousin standing underneath the boom of the crane with both arms in the air. It was at that point, he told the inquiry, that he saw the jib, the extendable arm of the crane, fall on top of his colleague. A badly injured John Cousin was taken off the tower by boat to a waiting ambulance, but he would never recover. As the inquiry examining the circumstances of his death continues, it's expected that by next spring a memorial will be permanently installed overlooking the bridge that John Cousin helped build, but never saw finished. Stephen Gordon reporting Scotland, Stirling Sheriff Court. You're watching BBC Reporting Scotland. It's 17 minutes to seven. A reminder of tonight's top story. The new Scottish Labour leader says his predecessor Kezia Dugdale didn't have permission from the party to go on I'm a Celebrity. And still to come, the Australian rugby squad have arrived ahead of their match against Scotland in their final autumn test this weekend. Road safety campaigners want more 20 miles per hour zones in Scotland to cut the number of deaths and injuries on the roads. Their call comes after the latest figures showed excess speed was a contributing factor in hundreds of accidents last year. Our reporter Suzanne Allen has been speaking to a man who suffered devastating injuries following a road accident. You may find some pictures in her report upsetting. You interested, son? Looking after these fish is Colin's relaxation. 
he has a brain injury, takes 24 tablets a day and can only stay awake for a few hours. He doesn't remember much about the crash. I was travelling on a B road uh, and a vehicle in front of me was turning right and um, basically I was sitting behind him and the next thing I knew, everything went black. Colin had been driving in a 30 miles per hour zone. He was hit head on by a driver who was estimated to be doing at least 50. Through no fault of his own, life has changed permanently. On the inside and out. I can't work anymore. I go downhill quite rapidly and unfortunately end up in my bed uh, most afternoons. Government figures show that in the 12 months up to June this year, 9,705 people were injured on Scotland's roads. And now new data from road safety charity Break shows that last year going too fast was a factor in 291 crashes. Four years before that, the figure was 231. That's up by a quarter. Today, road safety charity Break says it wants to see more 20 miles per hour zones. We've seen more people lose their lives uh, in Scottish uh, roads last year um, and more than half of the rise in uh, casualties nationally have come from roads in Scotland. So it's really uh, imperative that more is done to improve road safety. Uh, we would like to see more uh, urban areas going to a default 20 mile an hour speed limit. There are some 20 zones in Scotland. Edinburgh has the most, followed by some in the city centre of Glasgow and a few in Dundee. Even in my residential streets, I see people exceeding what would be acceptable for a residential area. I would love for them to know the consequences of their actions of breaking the speed limit. Suzanne Allen, reporting Scotland. Now, the Chancellor is putting his finishing touches to Wednesday's budget. Some of the focus will be on the 13 Scottish Tory MPs to see what influence, if any, they will have on the Treasury's plans. Our Westminster correspondent David Porter is outside number 11 Downing Street for us this evening. So, David, any suggestion that the Scottish Tory MPs will have bagged any wins? Katrina, this week's budget is a vital test for the Chancellor, but it is also a big test of the political muscle of the new Scottish Conservative MPs down here at Westminster. In an interview which he gave at the weekend, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, said that the number one ask, in his words, of his Scottish colleagues, i.e. Scottish Tory MPs, was for changes and help to the North Sea oil and gas industry. What they want sounds quite technical, but what they want are changes to the tax rate which would mean that tax allowances could be carried forward when oil and gas fields are sold and passed on from one ownership to another. It sounds technical, but those in the industry say that it is vitally important uh, to help get every drop of oil and gas out of the North Sea basins, particularly as oil fields get older and older. I think it, it would be extraordinary, having pointed that factor up in his weekend interview, if the Chancellor did not act on it on Wednesday, and certainly Scottish MPs, Scottish Conservative MPs, are hoping that will be the case. Mm. And of course, if there are benefits to Scotland from the budget, all sides will claim credit, won't they, David? Oh, they most certainly will. And another issue which could well come up on Wednesday, rebating VAT to the Scottish Fire and the Scottish Police Forces is an issue in point. Last week, the Prime Minister dropped a heavy hint that there would be something on it in the budget. If there is, the Scottish Conservatives will say it's because of their pressure. The opposition parties will say it's because of the pressure they have put on the UK government. Now, ahead of a budget, the Treasury never officially talk about what will be in and what will not uh, be in it. But certainly this is the first time in a generation there has been a large block of Scottish Conservative MPs. That means that those in number 11 and indeed those in number 10 Downing Street will be very aware of that block of Scottish MPs and trying to get them on side. Thanks for that, David. The family of a junior footballer who was killed in Leith have met lawyers to discuss how to appeal the sentence of the teenager responsible for his death. Earlier this month, a 17-year-old was detained for four years after he was found guilty of the culpable homicide of Sean Woodburn, who died after an incident outside a pub in Leith. Prosecutors will now submit a report to the Crown Office asking for a review of the sentence, which the family say is too short. 
The Scottish Professional Football League is defending its decision to allow Hearts until the morning of yesterday's match to receive safety clearance for Tynecastle's new main stand. The game against Partick Thistle, which ended in a draw, was in doubt until just hours before kick-off. Thistle say they're deeply unhappy, but the SPFL say they wanted to give Hearts every opportunity to get the match on. Meanwhile, Hearts have been drawn at home to their Edinburgh rivals Hibs in today's Scottish Cup fourth round draw. And now ahead of Scotland's final autumn rugby test, Australia have identified the man who carved up the All Blacks as the Murrayfield danger man on Saturday. Stuart Hogg nearly gave the home crowd a famous win over New Zealand and the Wallabies want to make sure he doesn't similarly inspire Scotland this weekend. Kennedy Nitsan reports. Hitting the gym after being hit hard by England at Twickenham. Australia are hurting in more ways than one. This man wants to inflict further punishment. And Stuart Hogg is through! After coming oh so close on Saturday to claiming Scotland's first ever win over New Zealand. He had an exceptional game um, on the weekend. He's a great player. I saw the highlights and he was covering up the AB, so um, you know, someone definitely to, to look out for. I don't think uh, fear is the word we want to use. I think, again, it's just our preparation that we want to prepare the best as we can and I'll prepare any other team. The visitors' confidence is understandable. Australia are third in the World Rugby Rankings and have won the World Cup twice, though not since 1999. Their last three matches against Scotland give the hosts hope, however, with two single-point defeats and then a win for Gregor Townsend's men this summer in Sydney. I feel like we're an exciting team to watch. Um, teams can't rest against us, regardless of where the ball is. Um, we've got the fitness. Um, Glasgow boys, Edinburgh boys, the Exiles guys that play in club rugby, we're all fit. Um, and yeah, look. We back ourselves. Uh, if we're in games with 60, 60 minutes gone and going into that last 20, we, we back ourselves to be fitter than anyone else. There could be an Aussie backlash, though. After shipping 30 points to England, coach Chaka was none too impressed with the match officials. His conduct is now being investigated. This place almost witnessed a famous weekend win. Making Murrayfield more menacing is part of the plan going forward. It was atmospheric against the All Blacks, but can it worry the Wallabies enough on Saturday to let Scotland finish this autumn test series on a high? Kerry Nidsan reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Hibs have announced losses of over a quarter of a million pounds, a figure their chairman Rod Petrie says is some way short of their financial target. But turnover for the year until June is its highest in four years, at £7.7 .7 million. The Edinburgh side won promotion at the end of last season and are currently third in the Premiership. The club say their yearly aim is to break even. And a former military bunker built to withstand a nuclear attack has gone in the property market. Highland Council, the owners of the once top secret underground shelter in Inverness, no longer wants it. Among its boasts are strengthened blast doors and decontamination facilities. Craig Anderson reports. The World War II bunker was designed to withstand a direct hit from the most powerful bombs of the time and then upgraded during the Cold War to counteract chemical, biological and nuclear attacks. It was most recently used as a nerve centre for civil emergency planning. But now the 10,000 square foot facility on two subterranean levels could be yours. And initially it was used uh, by the RAF to gather information from spotters and from the radar systems about uh, enemy aircraft and then uh, work with the fighter squadrons to send planes out to investigate them. The entrance doorway is the only clue above ground as to what lies below. The lucky purchaser will also get a tarmac car park and a bunker that boasts its own power generators and an air purification system. There are even static bikes installed so that pedal power can keep the air filters going if all else fails. There may even be a sitting tenant. There's reputed to be a ghost that lives uh, or haunts, should I say, the building. I, I've worked here a few years and I, I've, I haven't come across it, but it can be a bit eerie walking around here uh, at any time of the day just by yourself. Highland Council wants around £40,000 for the shelter and says all offers should be in its hands by the closing date of the 6th of December. Craig Anderson reporting Scotland, 
Inverness. So is the weather going to have us hunkering down in a bunker? Go as I can tell us. I think so, Katrina. It's been really horrible today, hasn't it, for many? Cloudy, damp and dreary conditions. And we continue with that for the rest of the week, in fact, staying rather unsettled. This is the scene at the moment. You can see areas of low pressure and a further weather system arriving, bringing more wet and windy weather across parts of the south as we head through the night. So misty, murky, extensive hill fog around, cloudy with further outbreaks of rain is the story for the rest of the evening. Across the north, the rain will reinvigorate, becoming a bit heavier, more persistent. Across the south, too, we'll see further outbreaks of rain piling in by the early hours with further hill fog around. And temperatures in towns and cities, while well, dipping to around 8 or 9 Celsius across parts of the southwest. But for Shetland, under the clearer skies here, quite chilly. Temperatures dipping close to freezing, perhaps a touch of frost. But elsewhere, mostly cloudy to start the day tomorrow with further outbreaks of rain. And that rain will become heavy and persistent, mainly across the north and west as we head through the day. And some of that rain particularly heavy, perhaps for Sutherland, for Caithness and into Orkney. Elsewhere too, some rain, damp conditions across the southwest. So if you're heading out around three o'clock, it's going to be quite cloudy, quite wet across more western areas. For the Lothians, the borders perhaps a bit drier. And with that milder air, the snow over the hills and mountains in the north will likely melt adding to the risk of some surface water and some localised flooding. That rain pushing into Shetland too as we head into the afternoon. And we continue with unsettled weather. And you can see how tight the isobars get as well as we look ahead to Tuesday night to start of Wednesday with some gales developing across parts of the Northern Isles. And Wednesday too, quite a wet picture across more southern parts of the country. Some heavy rain here, perhaps a bit drier across the north by the afternoon. And temperatures again, 11 to 12 degrees across the south, so still quite mild air. Looking ahead though, well, you can see quite a messy picture once again for Wednesday to Thursday. The wind direction becomes more of a northerly as we head through to Thursday. So perhaps some of that rain falling as snow once again up over the hills and mountains in the north, but becoming a bit drier and brighter by the afternoon. So quite a messy week in store. That's your forecast. Thanks for that, Corso. And now a reminder of tonight's main news. Theresa May is meeting senior cabinet ministers in an effort to make progress on the stalled Brexit talks. They're expected to discuss the so-called divorce bill. And the new Scottish Labour leader says his predecessor Kezia Dugdale didn't have permission from the party to go on I'm a Celebrity. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'm back with the headlines at 8 and again with the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Till then, bye-bye. <laughs>